So in verse 16, they're told to go forth as sheep in the midst of wolves and to be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. There are some commentators who believe that these words and those which follow were not spoken at the time when the twelve were first sent forth, but rather on a later occasion. Well, that may be so, but and the advice indeed may well be generic, but it's certainly relevant in this situation. And being a gen generic, it has all the more relevance for, e for us too today, as people who seek to follow in their footsteps. Now our Lord was the great shepherd, and they were sheep, creatures under his protection. In Luke 10 verse 3, when offering similar advice, the Lord even refers to his disciples as lambs. So whether sheep or lambs, they were going forth among wolves, perhaps the most ferocious predator of sheep in that region. Who were the wolves who would threaten the sheep? Well, in the immediate context, it was the hostile religious rulers of the Jews. And that's clear from the way the Lord goes on to warn them in verse 17 about being delivered up to the authorities. But we look, if we look at other New Testament references to wolves, we'll see that there is indeed a more generic application that's advice. Wolves are referred to six times in the New Testament. They are unscrupulous plunderers. Wolves are related to dogs, but as a species, it has completely defied domestication. All references to wolves in the New Testament are figurative. None of them refer to wolves in a literal sense. And the first reference to wolves is in the Sermon on the Mount, in just a few pages back in Matthew 7 and verse 15. Matthew 7 verse 15, the first reference to wolves. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So here we have the same two animals referred to in the phrase in Matthew 10. In fact, every reference to wolves in the New Testament is linked with sheep. Now these people lived in a country where there were wolves who routinely attacked sheep. So the, the imagery was very vivid to them. The Lord, the Lord was warning that the apostles were sheep who were going out among wolves. And here in Matthew 7, they, the wolves assume the appearance of sheep with the objective of deceiving the flock. So they're false teachers masquerading as sheep, but really they're ravening wolves. The next use of the word, of course, is the one we read in Matthew 10, and there's a parallel record in Luke 10. And then the next record is in John 10, verse 12. We'll just have a quick look at that. Luke, John 10, verse 12. And here the wolf is actually a hireling. John 10, verse 12. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. So here, the hireling is acting as a shepherd, but he's really only got self-interest at heart. And he cares not for the flock, only for what's in it for him. And as a result, they're exposed to the wolves. When we, were, when we succumb to a self-centred model, when we lose sight of the principle of the denial of self, which is at the heart of the gospel message, we develop a culture that is destructive of the ecclesia and of our brothers and sisters. If self-interest is driving us, we will leave them exposed to risk. The final reference to wolves is in Acts 20, and a particularly expressive passage. This passage brings together the thoughts contained in all these other references. In Acts 20, Paul warned the elders in Ephesus that after his death, there would be forces arise within the ecclesia which would corrupt the faith and draw away people from the gospel. Acts 20, 
and verses 28 to 30. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the ecclesia of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. This is a very clear reference, isn't it, to apostate teachers arising within the ecclesia and corrupting the purity of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. History confirms that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. If we go back to Jeremiah 5, I think we have what might be the source of this imagery of wolves threatening the flock of God from within. As is so often the case, our Lord's imagery is rooted in the Old Testament. In this case, in Jeremiah 5 and verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 5, verses 5 and 6. I will get me unto the great men, and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Every one that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. So in verse 5, Jeremiah refers to leaders, ecclesial leaders who once knew the truth about God's ways, but who had corrupted the gospel message and were leading the people into error. And the consequences of that is described in verse 6 in terms of marauding beasts that would threaten the flock, including wolves that would spoil them. This, in effect, is what happens when wolves in sheep clothing corrupt the ecclesia. It happened in the first century and it has happened ever since. And even today we remain at risk of wolves in sheep's clothing who can arise to ravage the ecclesia and cause great destruction. Brother R.G. L.G. Sargent comments on the wolves in sheep's clothing when discussing the Matthew 7 reference. Self-centred men are always devourers of others, absorbing their energies and dominating their personalities. But the egoism of these men may destroy for others, not only this life, but life to come. Such were the grievous wolves who, warned, who Paul warned the Ephesian elders would enter in among them, not sparing the flock. Now, there will also be times when the sheep needs to exercise a degree of craftiness in resisting evil. And Brother Roberts made this curious observation where he sort of turns this around a bit. Guileless artifice in fending off the assaults of evil is not inconsistent with the state of mind which God esteems righteous. Notice he says guileless artifice. Honour and truth are not sacrificed by measures designed only to catch a fish or scare a beast of prey. It is the wolf in sheep's clothing that is to be execrated. A sheep dons the wolf skin occasionally without the same subversion of principle. And I think that flows on to the next part of this verse that we've been looking at in Matthew 10. Back in Matthew 10, how were the apostles to survive in such a hostile environment in the first century? How would they cope with the threat posed by the, to the flock by the wolves? How are we to do so today? Well, verse 16 says they were to be as wise as, servant, as serpents. You know, go back to... Matthew 10 and verse 16. He's sending them forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents. The Greek word rendered wise is always translated wise in the authorised version. Bullinger says it means understanding, thoughtful, practically wise, sensible, prudent. In this verse, the Jerusalem Bible renders the word cunning. The New International Version, shrewd, and the English Bible, wary. So what is the Lord telling his disciples 
He's telling them to be wise, cunning, shrewd, wary as serpents. Well, how are snakes wise, cunning, shrewd and wary? Well, we can answer that question by considering how serpents conduct themselves. Snakes are extremely wary creatures. They secrete themselves in safe nooks to escape detection. And when they're threatened, if there's a ready means of escape, they usually are very quick to flee when danger arises. They tend to move about quietly without making much noise and fuss. Brother Robert suggests how this might apply to the disciples. Though kind and unresentful, they were not to be simpletons, but quick-witted and fertile in their expedients for avoiding evil. While they were not to fight the wolves, they were not to offer themselves to them, but to evade them by their adroitness. They were not to court persecution, like the crowds who, under the unwholesome influence of Ignatius in the second century, rushed to the stake. If danger arises, our wisdom is to get out of the way, just like the snake does. There, is a time, there are times, of course, when there is no escape and we have to make a stand. And the snake will do that too. But when there is an alternative, we don't necessarily just offer ourselves up for, and bring grief upon ourselves. We're to be wise as serpents. And as well as being wise as serpents, we are to be harmless as doves. Doves are a symbol of peace and purity. And the word rendered harmless in the authorised version is a wonderfully expressive word, but it's based on a mistaken etymology of the word. This Greek word is derived from a word which means the absence of foreign material. So Thayer defines it as unmixed or pure. Trench summarises the meaning as immunity from disturbing elements. Thus, we have Raymouth, the New American Standard Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the NIV, the ESV, all translating the word as innocent. Personally, I would think the word guileless might be the best translation. Better than harmless, however. Harmless is a misleading translation, I think. It's more the idea of innocent or guileless. And the word occurs only three times in the New Testament. Here and in Romans 16 and verse 19 and in Philippians 2 verse 15. And in both of those places, if you went to look at them, you'll see it's an attribute of that the saints are to, exhorted to develop. So rather than harmlessness, what the Lord is encouraging is guilelessness. What people see is what they should get. We should be the people we appear to be. Incidentally, we will be harmless, but that's not what the word is saying. There is to be no mixture in the ways of God, of the ways of God and the ways of flesh, in those who represent Christ to the world about them. They are to be all as Christ, not a mixture. Now, it must be admitted that there are times when the disciples fail in that regard, isn't it? Don't they? This is a very big ask, and we're not always successful in achieving that. In verses 17 and 18, the disciples are warned that they are going to encounter organised opposition at an official level. 17 and 18. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogue, and ye shall be brought before governments and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. I think the Introduction here, beware of men, is intended as a contrast with the kingdom of heaven that the disciples are to preach. They are to preach the kingdom of heaven and they beware of men. Because there are only two sources of authority in this world. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. When it all boils down to it, it's a duality. There are just those two authorities. When we preach the kingdom of God, it is inevitable that we will place ourselves at odds with the kingdom of men. And we might be, as we are in this country, very liberally treated and, and generously treated, but at the end of the day, we will end up at odds with the kingdom of men, 
When the kingdom of men has opportunity, it often acts aggressively towards this inherent challenge. Verse 17 in the authorised version mentions councils. It refers to the synagogue tribunals that operated at the time. You'd be aware of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, but that body was complemented by lower level councils. There were two of those in Jerusalem and one in each major town in the land. And they could exercise power in both civil and criminal cases. And these synagogue tribunals could enforce very severe discipline, which included excommunication and scourging. Now, under the law of Moses, you'll, you'll recall, the number of stripes that could be administered at any one time was limited to 40, in Deuteronomy 25. But to reduce the, mis the risk of miscounting, legal legal legalistic Jews reduced that to 39. So you didn't accidentally go over. And there were 168 offences which could be punished by scourging, which basically were all those crimes which didn't attract the death penalty. Uh, so, you know, you got off lightly if you got scourging, I suppose. The Mishnah describes the Jewish scourging in scrupulous detail. The scourge consisted of three thongs of leather, and the offender received 13 stripes on the bare breast and 13 on each shoulder. Another authority describes the process in even more gruesome detail. The offender was stripped from his shoulders to his middle and tied by his arms to a pretty low pi pillar that he might lean forward and the executioner might more easily come at his back. The executioner then mounted upon a stone to have more power over him and then scourged him both on the back and breast with thongs made of an ox hide in open court before the face of the judges. It's a pretty gruesome punishment. And the Lord says, that's what's going to happen to you. It was no light thing to be scourged. And the Lord's warning would not have been treated lightly. When they heard those words, they knew what it meant. It was no light thing. This was not just said for dramatic effect. It is indeed a prediction of what actually happened. Making a stand for Christ would come at a severe cost for many disciples. The Lord uses the same word in Matthew 23 when he predicts that the Jewish authorities would scourge some of them sent to preach to them. And in Acts 22, Paul admits that he beat in every synagogue them that believed on Jesus, and it means scourging. You will recall himself, that Paul himself was scourged five times by the Jews, no doubt in punishments imposed by the councils, as foreshadowed in this verse. Our Lord was subject to scourging under Roman law, not actually Jewish law, but under Roman law. Although, as ironically, as a Roman citizen, there was a law, the Porcian law, that granted Paul immunity from Roman scourging, and he invoked that immunity in Acts 22, as well you might, if you could, when you see what it involved. Now, when conscription was active in Australia, a few of our brothers suffered significantly at the hands of the authorities for the stand that they took. But even those who were mistreated, and some were subject to violence and, and un, un, very unpleasant treatment, but even those who were mistreated did not suffer anything as severe as this sort of scourging that was inflicted by the Jewish rulers like Saul before his conversion. So think about what that means when you're told you're going forth and this is going to happen to you. Well, those willing to face up to the risk of scourging probably weren't going to be intimidated by the challenge of verse 18, were they? Look again at verse 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But if you're willing to take the risk of scourging, you're probably not going to be too intimidated by that prospect. And the apostles and other disciples did indeed testify before governors such as Felix and Festus. You recall uh, Felix in Acts 24 and Festus in Acts 25. And before kings in the case of Agrippa in Acts 26. And indeed, 
many brothers have testified before government officials in the century since, and on rare occasions still have to. In verses 19 and 20, Jesus promises the apostles that they will receive divine aid when required to make such testimony. Remember, these men were humble, unlearned Galilean peasants, for the most part. They weren't skilled debaters, they weren't orators, highly educated in the skills of rhetoric. On the other hand, many of the Jewish leaders had memorised the Old Testament and they would make it very hard for humble fishermen were they not to receive some sort of divine help. Now, I personally do not believe that such supernatural assistance is available to us directly today if we were called into court, for instance, to testify about our faith. I note, however, it is remarkable how often in discussion with outsiders, a brother or a sister will surprise him themselves in their ability to respond to the challenges that arise. And they sometimes come up with answers they weren't even sure they understood themselves until the question was asked. And that's happened to me, and, I, and I've known, I've heard other people say exactly the same thing. I actually don't think that's a supernatural thing, but uh, we are very blessed. And of course, we have the benefit of a word of God that we can look at and hold in our hands and read and have reference to whenever we need to. Verses 21 and 22 express a bitter truth that many have experienced. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. <clears throat> Our Lord one day will be the Prince of Peace, but in this dispensation, he sometimes causes division within families. And the Lord understands the anguish this causes because he himself was a source of division within his own immediate family. So he knows the pain felt by those who might experience such tension when, because they have embraced the gospel and some of their family doesn't share their enthusiasm. Verse 22 is especially challenging and I put it to you, especially challenging for young people. No normal person wishes to be hated. <coughs> Yet this can be the lot of those who serve Christ. And note that the Lord said all men in verse 22, which I think is hyperbole, but it's hyperbole designed to highlight how widespread such antipathy might be. As brothers and sisters of Christ, we should do all we can to live peaceably with all men, we should not set out to provoke hatred, but much of what we stand for will cause men and women to dislike us. And that, that is increasingly so in this modern world, because we stand for things that the world no longer stands for. And indeed, our very opposition to certain things is treated with contempt now. When only a few years ago, it didn't look so odd. And obviously, I'm referring to matters like homosexual marriage and, and so forth. There are a range of moral issues where we once reflect, reflected the mainstream views and we no longer do. And people aren't just happy for us to be different. They actually despise us for thinking differently. And you'll hear them on, in, on radio and so forth you know, being quite disparaging about these ignorant people who can't see the obvious wisdom of their views. John in 1 John 3 verse 13 said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And so it is that our stands on issues like the sanctity of marriage, on irregular relationships, homosexuality, and even things like gambling can cause antagonism with others who don't share those values. Verse 23 is a restatement of the doctrine of non-retaliation and turning the other cheek. You'll remember it's in Matthew 3, of course, Matthew 7, uh, Matthew 5, but it's here again in verse 23 of Matthew 10. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone through over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. 
So this is their job, to go forth and make a stand. And sometimes that stand will require them to flee. Well, we must also make a stand when that's necessary. But we don't seek to be martyrs, if that can be avoided. Now, that might mean, perhaps, moving somewhere else to eliminate the source of tension. And indeed, there are brethren overseas that are doing just that as we speak, having to leave the countries they live in as refugees and finding somewhere more congenial. But what did Jesus mean when he set a time limit in verse 23? Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. This clearly has to relate to the lifetime of the, the, the apostles. So obviously the time limit is not the return of Christ, which in our own day is so very imminent. Rather, I think it's a reference to the time of AD 70. I think we can link this sentiment with the last phrase in verse 22, which refers to those who endure to the end being saved. In what sense could the apostles be said to endure to the end if that end were the return of Christ to re-establish the kingdom of God on earth, which even now is in the future, some 2,000 years later? Clearly it must have been an end which could be reached during the lifetime of at least some of the apostles. Now there is a sense in which our Lord came in AD 70 when he brought the armies of Rome to punish the men and women of Judea who had rejected him. And that in itself is the subject for another Bible class, perhaps even a series, in its own right, because it's a very broad subject. Very briefly, however, to just to close the logic of this passage, let's look at Matthew 22, at the parable of the marriage feast, which makes an allusion to this concept of Christ being involved in the judgments of AD 70. Matthew 22 and the parable of the marriage feast. Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my, my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them shamefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. I put it to you that in verse 7, the king is the Lord Jesus Christ who sends forth an army to destroy those who slew his emissaries and to burn their city. And that's exactly what happened when the Romans were sent as agents of divine judgment in AD 70, just as the Babylonians had been agents of divine judgment in the days of Zedekiah. In his book, The Last Days of Judah's Commonwealth and its Latter-day Restoration, Brother John Thomas quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5, and a range of other passages, and makes a case for three comings of the Lord. He's coming in John's baptism. He's coming to take away the daily sacrifice and the kingdom from the chief priests. And he's coming to abolish Christendom and to restore the kingdom of Israel, to Israel. The second of those, of course, is AD 70, the Roman siege and sacking of Jerusalem. And those interested in pursuing that theme might also like to look at what Brother Roberts writes in Nazareth Revisited. I think it's interesting to know that it, this is not just a Christadelphian fantasy to recognise the logic of this idea of Christ coming in AD 70. In commenting on Matthew 10, verse 23, the Reverend Carr makes this observation. The passage in Luke 21, which to a great extent, which is to a great extent parallel to this, treats of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, that's, of course, yesterday's reading. You recall the siege of Jerusalem in verses 20 to 24 of Luke 21. And no one who carefully weighs the Lord's words can fail to see that in a real sense he came in the destruction of Jerusalem. That event was in truth the judgment of Christ falling on the unrepentant nation. 
So I suggest to you that the promise in Matthew 10, verse 23 would have been very comforting for the apostles as they faced the persecution about which the Lord warned them. They would recall these words and take comfort from them. And although we do not live in the era leading up to the sacking of Jerusalem, we do live on the very eve of the Lord's coming in judgment to re-establish the kingdom of God on earth. And what I hope we've seen tonight and in our previous class is that the advice the Lord gave his apostles as they went forth to preach the word in the first century is full of relevance for us in the 21st century as we also preach to people on the eve of judgment and the return of our Lord. Thank you.